welcome back. So in this video, we're going to continue looking at uh, the JavaScript language and the P5.js library. And we're going to start actually editing some code. Uh, we're going to look at foundational programming concepts and how they're used in JavaScript. Uh, we're going to look at how to organize our code using functions, uh, which help us manage abstraction. And we're going to look at how to store our data using variables. Then we're going to look at the P5.js library, uh, how to edit the default sketch that uh, we get on openprocessing.org. And then we're going to look at uh, functions and variables that are built into P5.js. Uh, so the functions that we'll look at will make it easy to generate computer graphics. And then the variables that are part of the library are going to make it easy to make them interactive. OK, so now we're going to get started at openprocessing.org. So I already created an account. So if you haven't created an account, you can do that now. Uh, I'm going to sign in. And right underneath the profile picture, you could go to create a sketch. OK, so these eight lines of code here serve as our starting point. Um, and luckily, there's not that much to break down. So at the end of the video, hopefully, you'll see it's pretty straightforward. So the first thing we could do before we start to look at the code is we could run the code. So we go up here to the play button. And we could see that we get this gray background. And uh, when we move the mouse cursor around, we uh, draw a white circle at the location of the cursor. The white circle has uh, what looks like a black border. And it looks like it's going to continue doing this as long as the code runs. Uh, so let's go back to the code. We could click on this icon. So right now, if we have no idea what this code does, it's OK, because we have some familiar things, like uh, we have a numerical value here. And one thing we could do with that is change it and see what happens. So let's try doubling that number. And it looks like uh, instead of the sort of darker gray background, we have a lighter shade of gray. Everything else seems the same. Let's go back to the code. Uh, we could instead try cutting that number in half from its original value. So if we give it 50, uh, then we get an even darker gray than we started with. So we could change that back to the original value. And uh, so it looks like we're dealing with numbers on a gray scale. So uh, lower numbers represent darker shades of gray whereas higher numbers represent lighter shades of gray. So this leads into our first important concept, uh, is that this line, line 3 here, is what we call a function. And uh, we already know what this function does. It sets the background color. And uh, we could recognize it as a function by its syntax. So here we have the name of the function, followed by a set of parentheses. And uh, inside the set of parentheses, we have uh, an argument. In this case, it's a numerical value. Finally, we have a semicolon at the end. If we were to do something like accidentally leave off uh, part of the syntax, like uh, one of the parentheses, then we try to run the code. We could see down here on the console, we get an error message. Uh, and you'll encounter a lot of error messages in programming uh, because we will make mistakes as we build programs, and that's normal. Uh, this error message tells us it's a syntax error, and it's pretty specific. Uh, it, it knows that it's missing a parenthesis. And it even tells us what line uh, of code that the error is on. So if we go back to line three on the code, we could see uh, we have uh, an error display here, expected a parenthesis instead of a semicolon. So we can fix the error by putting the parenthesis back in. And there are other types of errors as well. Uh, like if we were to accidentally make a, a typo in the name of a function and we tried to run the code, we would get another error. Uh, Again, it's telling us that the error is on line three. It says background is not defined. So what's going on here is that uh, when the computer interprets this code, it recognizes this as a function call. Uh, and it looks in uh, the code that it has access to, and it looks for a definition of a function called background. And it doesn't find one, uh, so it can't run the program. So we could fix that by changing it back to background. Uh, and then it has a complete function definition for the background function, and it could run normally. Uh, now, at this point, you might be wondering, uh, if this is a function, why does the keyword uh, function appear here on line 1 and here on line 6? And uh, why do these look so different from uh, here on line 3, which we know is a function? So the difference here is that what we have on line 3 is called a function call, whereas what we have here on lines 1 to 4 and lines 6 to 8 
our function definitions. So the error we just saw was an example of the computer seeing a function call but not having a corresponding definition for that function. So when we define a function, uh, we get to decide what happens when we call the function. The syntax for a function call is going to be this keyword function, which in this editor is going to be displayed in blue uh, because it's a keyword, uh, followed by the name of the function uh, and a set of parentheses. In this case, uh, these functions don't are th these functions aren't designed to take arguments, unlike the background function which expects an argument. Uh, so we just have an empty set of parentheses here for these two functions. So after that, finally, we have a set of curly brackets. Uh, and everything inside the curly brackets defines what we call a block of code. In this case, the block of code is the body of the function, the code that gets run when we call the function. Now, uh, this is an important bit of syntax because if you were to leave off one of these curly brackets and we try to run the code, then uh, we get another error message. We get an uncaught syntax error. So in this case, uh, it tells us the error is on line eight. And uh, that's not incredibly helpful for us because, uh, well, we know here that we left off uh, one of the curly brackets defining the function body on line four. Uh, but as the code interpreter sees an opening curly bracket here on line one, and it interprets everything after that as being part of the body of this function. It's only until it gets to the end of our sketch and it uh, realizes it never saw a closing curly bracket uh, to close off that function. So it tells us our error is on line eight, even though the error is not actually on line eight. So this is an example of an error uh, that's a little bit harder to interpret. But if you see unexpected end of input, you, you uh, should know that it usually means that we uh, forgot a curly bracket. Uh, that we didn't define our blocks of code correctly. So if you see that error, you know a little bit about what to look for, even if the computer can't tell you exactly uh, which line of code the error is on. So I'm just going to fix that. Uh, OK, so let's recap. Uh, we know how to recognize a function call and uh, a function definition. Here we have a call. Here we have a definition. But you might notice that uh, we never call these functions set up and draw. And uh, yet the code still works. And that's because these functions setup and draw are special functions in the p5.js library. Uh, setup gets called once when we press the play button and the computer runs the code. And draw, uh, you might have guessed, is a function that gets called over and over again. Uh, these being special functions have to have these names setup and draw. Otherwise, p5.js uh, doesn't know uh, what these functions are supposed to represent. So if we were to change the name of the draw function to my function, for example, and we tried to run the code, then it would no longer be drawing anything uh, because it doesn't have a definition for the draw function. Only when that function is called draw does it uh, work according to its design. OK, so background is one of the functions that we're using. Uh, we know a little bit about how that works. So let's look at this function, ellipse. Now, uh, you might notice that uh, this function has four arguments instead of one argument. And that's going to vary function to function. These functions are both part of the p5.js library, and they have different designs. Uh, this one happens to expect four arguments. So if we were to change one of these numerical values, let's say, let's change, let's double this value, change it to, uh, from 20 to 40 and run the code. And it looks like we get this uh, proper ellipse shape now. And it's, uh, it's wider than it is tall. We could go back to the code. And if that uh, represents the width, maybe, then we should guess that this probably represents the height. And we could run that. And uh, then we get an ellipse that's taller than it is wide. OK, so this ellipse function is taking four arguments. And we can see that uh, two of the arguments are just numerical values. And uh, two of the arguments have names. Uh, now, we could probably guess uh, that these represent the coordinates, uh, like the location of the circle. Uh, and by the names mouse x and mouse y, we could guess that they represent horizontal and vertical coordinates, respectively. And um, the value of those coordinates are changing whenever we move the mouse. But why do these have names and why do these have values? Uh, the reason is these are uh, what we call variables in programming. 
So uh, we can find out what the value of a variable is if we don't know uh, by, for example, using the print function. So let's, let's pass mouse x to the function print. And when we run this, it should open up a console here. And we should see that uh, we're printing a numerical value that changes depending on the horizontal location of the mouse. So over here on the left, uh, we get a value of 0. And if we move it over to the right, uh, we reach a maximum value of 1,151. So uh, these represent uh, pixels. It's basically the, the width of the screen right now is 1,151 pixels wide. If we were to print the Y coordinate now, we could see something that's a little bit unusual uh, that you might not be used to. Uh, namely, here we're used to a Y coordinate uh, representing height where uh, a larger Y coordinate is a higher value and a lower Y coordinate is a lower. Uh, in computer graphics, it's a little bit flipped uh, with the Y axis. So we have a low value here at the top of the canvas and we have, and as we move down through the canvas, we get higher and higher numbers. And almost every environment for programming computer graphics is like that. Uh, the, y, the Y coordinate is flipped. So that's just uh, something to get used to, something you have to remember. Uh, X, the X direction is in the normal orientation. The Y direction is upside down. OK, so uh, I'm just going to get rid of that so we don't need that. Uh, now, mouse X and mouse Y are variables. Uh, you might also guess here that window width and window height are variables as well. Uh, and we could do something similar. We could print window width. And right after that, let's print window height. And we'll open up the console again. And that should only happen once. Uh, that we didn't put those uh, fun we didn't put those prints in draw. So it's not going to print over and over again. We put them in setup, so it's only going to happen once. Uh, and we get uh, the width and the height of the screen that we observed before. Okay, so let's get rid of that. Uh, now, variables are going to be a real useful tool in programming. Uh, we could create our own variables uh, when it suits us, so when it makes the code easier to organize. So let's say, uh, for example here, we have uh, essentially, if we want to draw a circle, we could use the ellipse function. But if we know we're only going to draw circles, for example, like in our game, uh, we don't really need to specify both a width and a height. Uh, we could just specify the diameter of the circle. So it would actually clean up the code a little bit if instead of having to uh, put this number in twice, so let's say if we wanted to change the diameter, I'd have to change this number in two places. Instead, if I only wanted to change it in one place, I could, do, uh, I could, def I could define a variable. So uh, the syntax for doing that is we type let, and let's another keyword, so it's uh, highlighted in blue. So after let, we can type the name that we want to give the variable, and we could call it anything we want. Uh, usually, it's good programming practice to call your variables something that describes what the variable is, uh, how it functions, and this is to make the code easier to read. So uh, we'll call it diameter. So I'll say let diameter equal 20. And then we'll terminate that with a semicolon. So I could take the name of that variable now, and I'm just going to copy it. And I'll paste it in here and here. So now if I want to change the size of the circle, the diameter of the circle, to 50, I only have to change it in one place. OK, so you might have noticed now that uh, this variable that we created is just plain black text wherever it appears, whereas these variables, window width, window height, mouse x, and mouse y, are highlighted in this uh, sort of teal color. Uh, and that's because they are part of the p5.js library. Now, it's important to remember that all the syntax we're learning is part of JavaScript, but the functions that we're using, and in the case of these variables, uh, these are all part of the library. So if you try to write JavaScript without this library, uh, you won't have access to all these functions and variables, but you'll still be using the same syntax. Now, in the previous video, I showed a website that had uh, documentation for the p5.js library. But uh, if you're using the editor, you don't act actually have to open up a separate uh, website for that. 
there's a link in here. You could go over to uh, this icon right here, and it'll open up a uh, code reference. And you can click on any one of these, and it'll open up the corresponding documentation. And uh, we could search through the documentation. We could search for any of these functions or any of these variables. So for example, we could find the documentation for the background function. And we'll see uh, that we could call it like this, specify a grayscale integer value, and that's what we've been doing. Uh, and you could also specify colors in other ways, like providing red, green, and blue values. Uh, we'll look at that later, but for now, we'll just go back here. Uh, we could search for the uh, uh, variables that we're using as well. So mouse x, if we click on that, it'll tell us uh, that this, all, this variable always contains the current horizontal position of the mouse relative to zero, zero of the canvas, which is the origin in the upper left. So uh, you know that whenever you see anything highlighted in teal, it's part of the P5JS library. When you see blue, it's a keyword like function or let, and there are others we'll see as we, uh, as we continue. When we define our own variables, they're just gonna be plain black text. So uh, this code reference over here on the right is gonna be really useful uh, for whenever you come across uh, something you're unfamiliar with, or if you need to discover a new way of doing something. Uh, you could browse through all these functions and see how they're used. They give you examples and they show you the syntax. Uh, I wanna show you one uh, really useful function, especially for doing things like games, uh, because randomness is gonna be part of a lot of games. We wanna often generate random numbers. So I'm gonna search for random, and uh, we could go down, here it is. So we could see here's an example of a function now uh, that's a little bit different from the ones we've been using. Uh, here's a code example, and let's just look at this line for now. Uh, we could call it random, specify a value, and it actually, this function now returns something. Uh, we could define a variable to hold the return value of this function. So it's gonna generate a random number. Here we go, if we give it one argument, it's gonna return a random number from zero up to, but not including that number. So let's try something. Let's try, uh, instead of giving it a fixed diameter of 50, let's create a random diameter between zero and 50. So we see that every time it draws a frame, it creates uh, a new random diameter. Okay, so the last important thing I want to show here is that uh, we saw that in the setup function, uh, we have two functions that should run only once. Create canvas uh, gives us a background to draw on, and the background function sets the color of the background. Uh, we saw that in the draw function, we do whatever we want to happen over and over again. So if I take this call to background and I cut it, and I paste it right here, right above the ellipse function, and I run it, we could see that it, we only ever see one circle at a time because that call to the background function uh, overwrites anything that was previously drawn on the last call of the draw function. And it's sensitive in other ways to the ordering of uh, the way we call these functions. So for example, if I were to put this call to background after the ellipse function, then uh, we see nothing because what's happening every time it draws the frame is it's drawing an ellipse, and then it's immediately overwriting that ellipse with a, a call to background, which clears everything out and sets everything to one color. So uh, you want to be aware that uh, anytime code is getting executed, it's getting executed in order, top to bottom. And uh, certain orderings of functions are going to give you unexpected behavior. So you want to think through uh, the process of how you want to draw every frame. Okay, to summarize, uh, we learned how to use functions in JavaScript. Uh, and if we want to call a function, we have to call it by name, followed by a set of parentheses. And depending on how the function is designed, we might need to specify arguments or we could leave them empty. Uh, if we want to define our own functions, we could use the function keyword followed by a set of curly brackets that define a block of code that represents the body of the function. And then we learned uh, some functions that are part of the P5JS library that help us, help us draw computer graphics. So uh, 
we need to define setup and loop functions. Setup is going to run once when we run the code, and a loop is going to run repeatedly. In setup, we should create a canvas that gives us a background to draw on, and we could set the color of the background using the background function. And in our case, uh, we only saw how to draw circles and ellipses using the ellipse function. Uh, we also saw that background and ellipse are sensitive to ordering, so uh, we might want to clear the background on every frame. We might want to set the background only once at the beginning. Uh, it depends on what we want the result to look like. We also uh, saw how to create variables in JavaScript using the keyword let. We also saw variables that are built into p5.js that are useful for uh, telling us the size of the, the browser window, so that it's width and height. We also saw these two variables that tell us where the user is placing their cursor, uh, mouse X and mouse Y. And when we use those things, we have to keep in mind that the coordinate system of most uh, computer graphics drawing libraries uh, has a y-axis that's inverted, whereas the x-axis is has the normal direction. So that's it for this video. So join us in the next one, and we'll start to code up our bounce game, and we'll look at uh, what sorts of physics that we need to model in order to create a realistic-looking bouncing ball.